And welcome to High School Physics Explained. And today I want to discuss and explain to you the concept of circular motion. And we're going to start by looking first at an example of a situation you're probably familiar with. And that is spinning some object around your head with a rope. So here I have a gentleman with a rope and there's a ball hanging off the end of it. And what we're going to do is going to simulate what he's doing and that is he's spinning it around. So as you can see, what we have here is a ball that is spinning around in a circle. Now how would you describe that motion? Well, first of all, the obvious, it's traveling in a circle. But at any particular time, the actual ball is moving in a velocity that is a tangent to that circle. So if I show you the velocity and turn that on, you can see that the velocity at this point is always a tangent to that circle. Now if the ball continues to turn, then you can see that the velocity also changes as a result. Because as you know, velocity is a vector quantity. That is, it has both a size and a direction. And so although in this example, I'm assuming that the ball is moving around at a constant rate, that the size of the velocity is constant, because of the fact that its direction is constantly changing, then we say that the velocity is constantly changing as well because of the fact that its direction is changing. Now, what does that mean? Well, if a velocity is changing with respect to time, we say it is accelerating. And the only reason something can accelerate is if there is a some sort of net force exerting on that. Now, what is that net force? Well, in this case, the force that is causing the object to continually change direction is a force that the gentleman is applying via the string. If we now ask the question, what is this force? We have a force that is pointing towards the center of the circle. So as we rotate it around, you can see that the velocity is constantly changing. And so is the force, not the strength of the force. The strength of the force is constant as it moves around but the direction is constantly changing. But the thing is, it's this force that causes the object to continually change. That is, as long as that force exerts itself, the velocity continues to change in direction. The other critical thing, though, is that the angle between the velocity vector and the force vector is always 90 degrees. And that, in essence, gives you the definition of something undergoing circular motion. An object is moving with a certain velocity and experiencing a force that is always at right angles to the direction of the, of the velocity. And hence the object moves in a circle. Now, this force, of course, is a constant value in terms of its magnitude, and it is causing the object to continually change direction. We call this force the centripetal force, it's important you pronounce it correctly because it is often confused with another term, which I'll refer to in a moment. This centripetal force always points to the center. Now, often people think, well, this centripetal force needs to be carried by some sort of rope, but that's not necessarily the case. So here I have an example of what we call in an amusement park, a graviton. That is, you sit inside a large circular uh, object and it spins really fast and you feel yourself glued to the edges. So for example, it spins around and that blue and brown thing you see represents a person. And as this particular graviton spins around, you feel stuck to the wall. But the point is, it is that this is an example of circular motion. And circular motion means that you have a velocity that is always at a tangent to that circle, or in this case, just inside this particular circle. Its velocity is going, in this case, upward direction. If I were to represent the force in this case, it is the force of the walls. In this case, rather than some sort of string, you have the walls pushing you inward. So as this spins around, what you are experiencing is the walls are pushing you in towards the center. That is the centripetal force. 
Again, note that the centripetal force is always at right angles to your velocity at any one time. Now, what would happen if suddenly the walls were to disappear at this junction? So if the walls would disappear, this force here would disappear. And as a result, you would continue to move in a straight line. Now, some people get confused with another apparent force that they experience. And that is a force that is often referred to as a centrifugal force. But I want to make it perfectly clear, there's no such thing as this centrifugal force. And this is the force that often people feel that is exerted in that direction. Now, let me make it first of all clear. The force that you are experiencing, which is the normal to the surface, is the centripetal force, which in this case is pointing towards the center along here. Of course, your velocity is heading in this direction. And yet you feel like you're being flung out. But according to your frame of reference, that's the direction you feel you are flung out. But there is actually no force you are actually experiencing in that direction. The force you are experiencing is actually inward. It's a bit like this. You are being flung towards the center of the Earth due to Earth's gravitational field. And the Earth is in the way, and so the Earth applies a force upward. So the pressure that you feel on your backside if you're sitting or on your feet if you're standing is not a force downward, as often misunderstood, uh, but it's actually a force upward. And so too here, this is a force that is, ex the force you're experiencing is this force here. So what is this here? Well, you're feeling like you're being flung out, but in actual fact, you're in a rotational frame of reference. You are actually flung out at a tangent, but because of the spinning, this has the sensation of going outwards. Secondly, you need to understand that anything that is going outward, that is only the force of you acting on the wall. So the wall is experiencing this force, but remember, we're interested in the forces on you. So it's really important that this is not a force, a real force. If this centripetal force were to suddenly disappear, then this is not existent either. And as a result, you would continue off in a tangent to the circle. So let's make it clear. It's centripetal force, not the other word. So let's have a look at some of the aspects. First of all, we have the velocity, which is, of course, that arrow there. We have our force, which is there. And then finally, we have our string here. In this case, I'm going to use this to represent the radius of this circle. These things here are all intricately connected as long as we also understand that this object here has some sort of mass these things combine together to form a formula. And the formula is often written like this. F with a subscript C standing for the centripetal force is equal to the mass multiplied by the velocity squared over R. Now, since you know that F is equal to MA, that is the net force on an object is equal to the acceleration times the mass of the object, you can clearly see that the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. And so what that means is that if you want to increase the centripetal acceleration, you need to increase the velocity. And you can probably understand that if you spin this object faster around your head, you're going to have to apply a greater force. And the relationship is a square relationship. Similarly speaking, if you want something to spin at a constant rate and the mass is constant and yet you shorten the string, then the centripetal force will obviously increase as a result. Now, I'm not going to go into the derivation of this because as you know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, but because this is a changing velocity in terms of direction, this requires a little bit more mathematics and that will be a subject of another video. But let's have a look at a couple of other examples that involve centripetal motion or circular motion. So here is an example you're probably familiar with. We have the Earth and we have the Moon. And of course, the moon revolves around the Earth. And so 
it may move around like this. Now, obviously, it doesn't go backwards and forwards, but I'm just going to run off the screen here. But the question is, what causes the moon to go in a circular path? Well, the reason it moves in a circular path is that there is a force of attraction between the two objects, and that is the gravitational force. It's a force of attraction, but of course, we're interested in the fact of the force exerted on the moon. And as you can see that the arrow is at 90 degrees to the direction of the motion of the moon. So in other words, in this case, we say that the force due to gravity or the gravitational force is actually equal to the centripetal force in this case. Now, if you wish to explore this further, I have already another video where I discuss the relationship between circular motion in gravitational fields. Another example is an example of car going around a track. Now, I've got a circular track here, but it involves basically any situation where there is a corner involved. And if you pay attention, most corners around the streets are based on circles. And I want to spend a little bit more time on this situation. So here's my car and of course it moves around in around the track like so and travels in a circular path. And at any one time of course the car is moving in a tangent to that path. But what causes it to turn? Well that is of course due to the fact that we have a force that is being exerted on the car towards the center of the circle. Now what is that force? Well, that force in this case is the actual friction of the surface of the road. So here's my car. And in the case, we're looking here as this car is coming towards you. In that case, the surface of the road is applying a force and it is a tangent to the circle. And so that is in this direction. Now, of course, if the car loses grip, then this force doesn't actually exert itself, this force of friction. And so we have a case here where the car may be traveling on a slippery road. And you would understand that if the friction uh, disappears, then the car will continue to move in a straight line and it will be flung off the road. And that is simply the car following Newton's first law. It'll basically not experience any net force and will continue on in a straight line. But what is therefore the importance that you often see of banking a road? Well, banking a road basically means you're placing the car on an incline. And it certainly allows a car to go much faster around the corners because it actually helps improve the centripetal forces exerted on the car. Now, you remember, in both these cases, we have frictional forces, but those frictional forces can only do so much. In this case, we're solely relying on the surface of the road. And so in that case, because the car is obviously on a level surface, the forces that are exerted on the car, in this case, gravity in that case, and the road surface on that case, you can see there's no horizontal component involved here. So the only forces that can cause the car to turn are these frictional forces here. And the fact is that the normal here and the gravitational force here cancel out. But now let's examine the situation of the banking. Now, of course, there are still forces acting and there are only two forces acting in this case, apart from the friction. And that is, first of all, the gravity acting on the car, pulling it down. But then what we have is also the normal of the road. And as you can see, the normal is always perpendicular to the surface. Now, what we have here is, is that the normal and the gravitational force do not cancel out. And when you add those two together, and I'll move this over here for the moment so that you can see what's going on, we end up getting a net force. And as you notice, that net force is actually pointing towards the center of the circle. So what we now have is an increased force acting towards the center of the circle. We have an increase in centripetal force. And because we have a centripetal force and it is increased, the formula is mv squared over r, then the object can either travel faster for the same radius 
or it can actually travel at the same velocity for a shorter radius. So banking actually improves the ability for a car to go around the circle. All because of the fact that the road surface, along with the frictional forces exerted by on the tyres, causes a force that allows the car to change direction. So there you have it. Circular motion, an introduction, with a discussion of centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. In another video, I'll do a few mathematical examples so that you can um, better understand centripetal forces and circular motion. But for the moment, I hope that's been helpful. Please like and share. Subscribe if you want to hear and see any more of my videos. Thanks for watching. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.